Happy Sunday, Mosaic. Happy Sunday, everybody. Come on into the room. Let's go ahead and stand if you are able. Thank you for joining us today, for those of you that are in the room, and thank you for joining us online, for those of you that are there. I'm Alvin Brown. I'm one of the pastors here at Mosaic, and so we're going to begin our time together with our call to worship, where this is a moment that we prepare our hearts to enter into God's presence, and so we are going to read aloud together 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. Are y'all ready? All right, here we go. Let's read aloud. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Father, we thank you, Lord. We enter into your presence, Father, with expectant hearts. No matter if we are at the lowest of lows, Father, in a life moment, or we are at the pinnacle of the mountaintop experience, Father, with you, Father, we cry out to you. We call your name. We sing your praises, Father. We call out your glory. We call out the wondrous works that you are doing, have done, and will continue to do until the day of your son's return. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you that your name reigns above all other names. We thank you that in your presence, those heavy burdens that we come in with are lifted. We thank you that though you were buried in shame, you rose in power. We thank you that you're the king above all kings. So God, we receive you, we will hold you. Lord of Lords today, we're reminded of your goodness, your sovereignty, and your love. So we choose to rest in that today. We choose to receive that for our lives, for the purpose for which you've called us. And we rest in that today. We thank you for it. We love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You just want to sit here for a minute, don't you? I know you do. <laughs> well, if you will indulge me just for a little bit longer and stand for, for, for just a moment, I, I, I'd like to take a minute to do something that's honestly one of my favorite things to do, and that's to recognize some of our newest church members. Uh, you're going to see their, their names floating on the screen. And, and this is amazing because God has just been so good to us. He continues to bless and grow us as a church. We get the joy of doing this actually regularly throughout the year. And today we're recognizing 44 people who've come. Yeah, you can get excited about that. You've heard me say this before, is that we believe that God places people in this body as he sees fit. And these individuals have gone through our membership process. And this includes a membership class, foundation classes, a membership interview. And, and they have made the decision that, that this is their home. This is, we are their family. And, and, and this is intentional. We, you look at the list of kind of things that we, we do, but our hope is that these steps would help you discern whether this is the place God's called you to be. Because church isn't just an event or some club you join. We believe it's a family that God calls people to. And so this is a, this is a meaningful moment for us. And I don't want us to brush past it. Because we can see the, the names on the screen and we can, we can, we can clap and, and, I, and I'm very grateful for that. But God's church is expanding. God's church, not our church, his church yeah. is expanding. And that's something we want to get excited about. And we want to invite you to celebrate and rejoice yeah. at what God is doing in our midst. Amen, church? So I want you to just uh, scream, clap, and out of your mind for what God's doing. See, that's why y'all my people. I like y'all. Y'all all right. Y'all all right. Well, just if, if you are interested in, in, in starting the membership process, just to give you a heads up, the, our next membership class is going to be on July the 17th, and the following week on July the 24th, we'll begin our foundations classes. So you'll learn more about that here in just a moment. Thank you for indulging me. You can go ahead and have your seat. There's so much more God has in store for us. You can direct your attention to the screen to find out more about Mosaic. Hey all, Jack Stevens here, the Interim Director of Broadcast and Visual Production with today's Mosaic Interview. Committing to membership at church is a defining moment in your journey with Christ. We explain more about that commitment in Mosaic's membership process. You are invited to check out the next membership class and the six weeks foundations course, both starting this month. Visit our events page and get signed up so you can begin the membership journey at Mosaic. A few other events happening this July are one, our technology interest meeting on Sunday, July 24th, and two, we hope you will all join us on Sunday, July 31st for a church-wide party as we celebrate the Brown Family Send-Off to Fort Worth, Texas. Details for those events are online as well. Finally, all men and boys 14 and older are invited to our annual men's retreat at Tejas Camp and Retreat in Giddings, Texas. This will be a Thursday evening, Friday through Saturday, August 25th through 27th. Make sure you've got these dates booked and your spot saved. Everything you need to know you'll find on our registration page. Space is limited, so sign up soon. That's all over. Thanks for walking this Christ in journey with me. I'll see you around at all the things. See, I thought y'all got rid of me, didn't you? Uh-huh. I'm right back up here. <laughs> But really quick, before we move on with our service, I wanted to, to make another announcement. Uh, this, and this is, this is a, an important one. And m many of you are already aware that over the, the past several months, we've been talking about in order to make more room for, for, for people to, to experience what God is doing here at Mosaic, the, the possibility of adding another service. 
And so over the weeks, we've had a lot of conversations amongst our staff and our elders and actually have surveyed many of you to what's the best way to move forward with that. And I'm excited to, to announce that starting on August the 14th, we will be having a third service at 12.30 p.m. Yeah, you can get excited about that. This service is going to be identical to our uh, other two services. You're going to get the same worship, the same message. We'll have M kids, so your children. Everybody say children. There you go. <laughs> they'll, they'll be taken care of. And so we're really excited about this. So you might be wondering, what does this mean for me? And I'm happy you asked that question. You're very brilliant, smart people. And so on one hand, not a lot's going to, to, to change. So our first service will still be at 9 a.m. Second service will still be at 11 a.m. But and you're going to have the same, the courses, the, the youth um, schedule is going to be the same. But on the other hand, we are doing this with a purpose. Our hope is that for the people who aren't in this room right now, that we'll make room for them. But in order to do that, we, we need your help. And, and we're asking you to prayerfully consider making the move to, to the 1230 service. That might mean having brunch that morning instead of doing lunch after service, right? Or maybe your errands or the chores you normally do on a Sunday afternoon. Maybe you do that first thing in the morning so that you can make it to that 1230 service. Whatever that might look like for you, we're inviting you to pray about that and see what God might have you to do because it's going to not only be a blessing to our church, it's going to advance God's kingdom in a meaningful way. Amen, right. church? And so I'm going to do a, just to make sure we all got it, right? We're going to do like the Cliff Notes version. I'm going to ask a question. You're going to give me an answer. You ready for it? Okay, so I'm going to ask you, what's the date? You're going to say August 14th. I'm going to ask you, what's the time? You're going to say 12.30 p.m. I'm going to ask you, how can you help? You're going to say, make the move. Are y'all ready? I don't know. I'm going to see. We're going to see. What's the date? August 14th. What's the time? 12.30. How can you help? I'll oh, see some of y'all faith went down on that third one. But I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Thank you for growing us and stretching us. And we pray that as, as your body, as your, as your flock, that we would, we would make the stretches that you're calling us to do to bring people into your flock, to bring people into your, your church. We thank you that these are, these are good challenges to have, that you are growing your church, your Big C church, and you're growing us. And we love you for it, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. <laughs> that was cool. Hey, as you can see and hear, uh, and as you've been told, we're beginning something brand new today. Video gives you a little clue. For the next five weeks, we'll be looking at five out of a group of 12 writers called the Minor Prophets. They've got some strange names, but some short and powerful messages. They're going to show us in a unique way all about the heart of God. And today we'll begin with our very first Minor Prophet, someone named Hosea. The scripture reading will be from chapters one and three. Here we go. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go, marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Deblame. 
The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loved loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a leg of barley. Then I told her, you were to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without an ephod or a household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. That's the reading of the word of God. All his people said, amen. amen. Yeah, you get, you get done reading something like this and you get to the end and you think either, man, this is super bizarre. Or you think this is why I left church in the first place. Or maybe you think both, and in which cases you might both be right. What's this all about? Uh, Ernest Hemingway, the, the writer, he wrote a short story a number of years ago called The Capital of the World. And in the story, the story was set in Spain. It was all about a young boy named Paco. And Paco wants to be a bullfighter. His father did not want him to be a bullfighter. Super dangerous. They experience conflict over it. And ultimately, the boy runs away from home and goes to the big city of Madrid where he wants to learn how to be a bullfighter. And the father goes to Madrid to look for his son, but he knew he'd never be able to find his son in a city that big. So the father takes out an ad in the local newspaper, which reads this. It says, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. And when the father showed up next Tuesday at noon at the Hotel Montana, there was not just one Paco. There were 800 Pacos waiting, all waiting for their father's. And the reason that's so powerful is this, because Hemingway is getting at a picture of the true human condition. Humanity as a runaway in need of a father to find and come bring them home. And in this book, the book of Hosea, God is a little like that father. It's like he's taking out a giant want ad in the world, but it's not in a newspaper. It's in a person through a person, through a person named Hosea. God is reaching out. He's talking to his people then and to us today to tell us exactly how he feels about you and me and us. How, how does God do that? How does God reach out to runaway people? That's what the book of Hosea is all about. So we'll frame the, the, what you're gonna hear this morning like this. How can we see the heart of God for human beings? How can we see that? Three ways here from the passage, Hosea's pain through God's problem. God's got a problem. We're going to look at it. And finally, through Gomer's price. Hosea's pain, God's problem, Gomer's price. Here we go. Number one, let's take a look at Hosea's pain. Start again. Chapter one, verse two. God told him, go and marry this promiscuous woman, have children with her, like an adulterous wife, the land's guilty. So why is Hosea in pain? Well, it's not too hard to see here. God's told this 8th century B.C. Hebrew prophet named Hosea in chapter 1 here to go and marry someone that the NIV calls a promiscuous woman. Another translation gives you the word harlot. Another translation gives you the word whore. I think you get the idea. Now, this isn't to shame her. This is just to describe her. Nor is this, of course, to shame any person or any woman in particular, because if you know your Bible, you know, there are many places where kind of the opposite of this story happens. Many places where a man acts poorly, perhaps is unfaithful to his wife, and it's the, the woman who acts redemptively. Now, this is happening because God is wanting his prophet, Hosea, to feel something in specific. We'll get to that. But Hosea does this. He obeys God. He marries a woman named Gomer, who's likely, possibly a prostitute. And he raised three children with her. The first two he had with her. The third child he named Lo-Emi. That means not mine. Hosea's in pain because by the time we get to chapter three, his wife becomes unfaithful to him and leaves him for other men. And of course, the question you're probably asking right here, a lot of people ask, is this, Why? <laughs> Why would God do this? 
What's, what, what does he have in mind here? And the answer is this. God is asking this of Hosea because he's reaching out to Israel then and to us today to show us something that he could not show us any other way, which is this. It's to show us that we will never understand fully who God is until we understand him as husband and lover. See, unlike the metaphors in the Bible, other metaphors that describe who God is, unlike the metaphors of shepherd, king, creator, I could go on, the book of Hosea shows us perhaps the deepest and most intimate part of the heart and nature of God. And this idea of God as husband and lover is all throughout Hosea's writings, and we see it perhaps most prominently in chapter two, where God says, we'll look at it, by the time I'm done relating to you, you won't be calling me something like master anymore. That was a play on words. The word Baal, the, the foreign gods of the other nations, was Baal. He says, you won't be calling me Baal anymore. By the time I'm done working in your life, you'll be calling me husband, lover. Look at this, chapter two. God says, uh, look at this. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness. I mean, three times he says, I want to, I will marry you. Does that make you just a little bit uncomfortable? It can. So why would God say that being in a relationship with him is like being in a marriage? Why would he say that? Let me give you three reasons in response to that question. And before I get into them, let me just say that the purpose of this next part is not to glorify or de-glorify marriage, nor to push you into getting married, nor to push you getting out of marriage. It's just to say that, again, in Hosea, God is trying to get across to us. We will never get him until we get this. So why would God say, once more, that being in a relationship with him is like being in a marriage? Three reasons. First reason, it's because marriage is demanding. Now, I didn't say your spouse was demanding, although that may be the case. Or not the case, in my case. Thank you very much. All right. First service, Carrie said, nice save. Yes. <laughs> but what I mean is to make any marriage work, it requires all of you. If your spouse isn't first before friends, before parents, before children, before your hobbies, the marriage can't last. Now, that's not to say that if your marriage didn't make it, it's because you didn't do this. The marriage is a, is a, is a two-way street. Maybe the other person didn't do this. So marriage is a mystery sometimes. We acknowledge this. We struggle with this. But sometimes, though, in marriage, we can get stuff backwards, like this quote. Let me show you from this a famous actress. If I said her name, you'd likely all know who she was. Is She was being asked... In this quote, she was being asked in an interview about her latest movie, and she had also recently gotten married and doing this interview about her new movie when she said this. She said, I had a boss moment the other day, she said. I was doing a press conference, and they keep, they keep asking me what it was like to be married. And I said, being married is not my achievement. My achievement is producing this film and having a producing deal with a major studio. That is my achievement. She added, Everyone shut up after that. It was really nice. Now, I hope her marriage makes it, all right? And I understand for sure that in particular, women have sometimes, many times, been defined exclusively in relationship to a man, to their husband. But I want to tell you, with all due respect, assuming I understand what she means, she's wrong. Because the work, even though our work is important, isn't the ultimate achievement in life. Then the Trinitarian nature of God says that relationship is the ultimate achievement. And therefore, the marriage, if you're married, is the ultimate achievement. Now, if your marriage didn't make it, please hear zero condemnation here today. That's not the point. I'm just trying to point out something I hope is obvious, which is that our work, in her case, the films, they'll come and go. Audiences will watch, use, and forget. But if you're married, your spouse supposed to come first. The marriage won't last. And God's saying here through Hosea, I don't just want to be your boss. I didn't want you even just to go to work for me. Work is not the achievement. Our relationship is the achievement. I want to belong to you. I want you to belong to me forever. Is that how you feel about me? See, marriage 
demanding. Second, marriage is also exposing. Exposing. What I mean is this. <laughs> you can fool some of the people all of the time. You can fool all of the people some of the time. But men, you can fool your wife little to none of the time. All right? Because she may not know what's up, but she knows when something's up. For example, Carrie will say to me, Morgan, I'm worried about you. You're depressed. I'll say, no, I'm not. I'm fine. She'll say, yes, you are. You're depressed. I'll say, no, I'm not. She says, yes, you are. Three days later, I'll say, I'm depressed. (laughs) She'll say, what's it like to be you? Like, you don't even know what's going on on the inside. (laughs) Listen. And women, wives, in the end, you aren't really fooling your husband either. He may just be extremely delayed in recognizing what's happening with you. All right. All right. But either way, my point is that long term, you're not fooling anyone in a marriage. You can come here and fool a lot of people here. Fool your community group leader, pastor, elder deacon, fool your friends. Probably could be fooling me. But if you are married and I wanted to know how you are really doing... Assuming it's your spouse, if you're married, would trust me enough to give me an honest answer, I would go ask them, not even you. Because marriage exposes you. Third, marriage is also transforming. You say, Morgan, you're not painting a very flattering picture of marriage so far. Like, I just got engaged. Please don't talk them out of it. All right. <laughs> Listen, my goal, my goal isn't to be flattering. It's to be... I hope appropriately honest and truthful here and will acknowledge what marriage really is, which is a demanding and exposing relationship of total commitment. And we commit ourselves to living through, walking in the tension of that. Now we get to this third aspect, which is that marriage can change your life like no other relationship. Uh, When Carrie says something affirming to me, for example, if she says, Morgan, you're the greatest man I know, even if she's lying a little bit there. <laughs> she says, you're the most handsome man I've ever seen. Now I know she's really lying, all right. Even if she fudges the truth a little bit, you know what that does to me because she knows me the best. When she affirms me, her affirmation changes me. And if it's withheld, that can be devastating as well. See, marriage has the kind of power to change even how you think about yourself for better and for worse. Uh, When it's bad, it can crush you. When it's good, it can lift you out of the depths, drive you out of the darkest, hardest times in your life. It can literally transform you. And so God is saying here, whether you're single, whether you're engaged, you're married, or you're divorced, I want to love and affirm you like that. My love can change you. It can enable you to face, take on, overcome the world. And that's what Hosea is trying to get across to us. So, marriage is demanding, exposing, and transforming. And because it has that kind of power, now you and I, now we know a little bit of how Hosea feels and his pain. Why? It's because as we now read Hosea's story, we're going to find that the person who has the power to love him and change him the most is using that power in a way that's destroying him. Hosea's heart is broken by the betrayal of the one who had promised to be faithful. And God here in this book looks at all of that and he looks at Hosea's pain and he says to Hosea, now you know how I feel. Now you know what it's like a little bit to be me. Now you know what it's like for me to love you, to love people, which now brings us to number two, God's problem. Not just Hosea's pain, but God's problem, because God has got a problem here. His problem is that he, like Hosea, except on a much larger scale, is in a relationship with people who are breaking his heart. We saw it in in chapter 1, verse 2. He says, like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. What's he aiming at here? Well, a little context. In Hosea's day, Israel had made a covenant 
years before, back in Mount Sinai, to be faithful forever to the one true God. And so these prophets were kind of like covenant watchers. They were appointed to watch over the covenant between Israel and God. But here in Hosea's day, Israel had been making treaties with other nations to make sure Israel remained safe and prosperous. And But God had said to them, I want to be your safety. I want to be your security. But the people said, we would rather have a treaty with a nation we can see rather than a covenant with the God we can't see. And they put themselves, therefore, into the arms of other nations, and those other nations' gods and idols and deities began to make their way into Israel's homes and hearts. And to see how much this hurt God, look look here at what, what happens in chapter three, because for Hosea and for Gomer, things have gone from bad to worse. In chapter three, we see Gomer, we're gonna read it, she has fallen about as far as a person could fall in that day, and really even today in a lot of ways, because as it turned out, even after she married this man, Hosea, she never stopped living her previous lifestyle. She kept on putting her, herself into the arms of other men. And by the time here we get to chapter three, Gomer is literally for sale. She's up on an auction block, and Hosea has to purchase her. How did she get there? Well, either because somehow she fell in debt. That was the way people fell into slavery then. Or what's also possible, maybe more likely, is that she had gone back to being a prostitute. And now she's for sale because her pimp was done with her. Either way, she is in this position because she's left Hosea, left her children, and gone back to her old life. And let me tell you, old lives, they don't play fair. Never do. Now she's for sale because she's for sale likely as a sex slave. She's there in public on the auction block, stripped, standing naked so her potential buyers could see the goods they would be getting. And with Gomer standing naked on an auction block, now God says to Hosea, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. God's telling him, no matter what she's done, go take her back, just like I keep taking back the children of Israel. Now, just a moment here. This is not, maybe some people have taught you this or told you this or taken it this way. This is not trying to tell you to always take back the spouse who's been unfaithful. Not what this is about. This is not about ignoring biblical grounds for divorce. Not this either. Now, this is showing us here that God has a problem. This is about God first. His problem, again, is that he keeps on loving, keeps on taking back people who break his heart by turning to other gods. Why did they do this? Why do they keep turning away? Why do we do this? Maybe to a spouse, to God. Why did Gomer do this to Hosea? Why does anyone do this to God? Henri Nguyen, you may know the name, was a professor at Yale Divinity, then he was a missionary in Latin America, finally was the director, spiritual director, of a community for the mentally handicapped in Canada. He was known for his brilliant insights into the spiritual life. You should read his books if you haven't. And once upon a time, one of his secular Jewish friends asked Nguyen to write a book about Christianity that could communicate the heart of the faith without like spiritual religious jargon. And the result was a book called Life of the Beloved. Life of the Beloved. And Nguyen says that one of, if not the main reasons people turn away from God is that they've forgotten something in specific. They've forgotten that they are what he calls the beloved of God, chosen by God. The beloved of God, chosen by God. We're God's beloved, he says. We're God's chosen. When we forget that, when it slips from our minds, slips from our hearts, we go back to our old lives and lovers. And when it says humans, when they forget, they're like people who are running around. They're looking for other voices to approve, other things to fill us, other things to call us, make us feel like we're beloved, feel like we're chosen. And when we run around looking for other voices to affirm us, he says that is the way to spiritual death. Here's this question. Well, how do we hold on then to our status How can we do what Gomer didn't do? How can we hold on to our status as God's chosen beloved one? Three ways, he says. First, keep unmasking 
the world around you. He says the world is kind of like a villain. It comes in and pretends like it's nice, pretends like it wants to play fair. You gotta unmask it. Remember it for what it is. It's a place where that can crush you, that can lie to you, tell that it's you, tell that you're a failure, you're unloved, that you're unwanted. He says, be realistic about what this world is. It's not heaven yet. It lies to you, it tries to rob your belovedness. Two, he says, keep looking for people and places where you are reminded of your deepest identity. He says, even though you can get this love from families, and you can get this love from churches or communities of faith, though, he says, it's gonna be limited and flawed, and he's right. Even so, people in healthy families, healthy spiritual communities can do this more often than not. They can repoint you, what we're trying to do right now, back to your status as God's beloved. And third, he says, you have to keep celebrating your chosenness constantly. Why? Well, because, man, pessimism, cynicism, negativity, they drive you down. This is the default setting of the human heart and in the world today. Oh, but gratitude, being thankful, reminds you that God's involved in your life. Therefore, you're still his beloved child. And he concludes like this. The unfathomable mystery of God is that God is a lover who wants to be loved. The one who created us is waiting for our response to the love that gave us our being. God not only says, you are my beloved, God also asks, do you love me? And that is the spiritual life, the chance to say yes to being the beloved. And when saying life is a little bit like a chance to say yes to our heavenly father's want ad. Come home, child. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. How can we do this? How can we say yes to God who loves us and wants us to love him back? By seeing number three, Gomer's price. Gomer's price. When God tells Hosea to go and bring Gomer home, of course, Hosea at first, he's got no idea what it's going to cost him. But he goes out. You can imagine he's wandering the city. He finds her out in the street up on this auction block. And when he sees his own wife for sale, now he begins to get a hint of the price he's going to have to pay. Because when it says this, it's showing you something. Verse 2, he says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And what he's showing you, this is that in the end, he had to bid. He had to haggle to buy his wife back. You can hear in his words the echoes of an auction, like 10 shekels, 12, 15, and a bunch of barley sold to who? Hosea? Aren't you like Gomer's husband? Yeah. And at the mention of his name, Hosea's name, Gomer would have likely opened her eyes. Maybe she's got him closed to preserve her last shred of dignity. And she would have seen and heard her own husband paying the price to bring her home. Hosea would have come up, would have clothed her, put a robe around her, put his arm around her, and brought her back home. And then Hosea said these words to her, verse 3. Then I told her. You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. In other words, Gomer, I paid the price for you, but there's still some work for us to do. But in the end, when the hard work is done, we're going to belong to each other. I'm going to belong to you. You're going to belong to me also. So did it work? Did it work? Well, we don't know for sure, but I think it did. I think there's reason to believe that it did because there's no more mention of Gomer's cheating or adultery anymore. The price, in other words, that Hosea paid, perhaps, potentially, likely, won Gomer's heart to the point she remained faithful to him the rest of their lives. So, why does any of this matter? Here it is. This matters because it shows us that as much as we need God, our king, to rule us, And as much as we need God, our shepherd, to guide us, we need the intimate love of God as our spouse to heal us. See, what the law couldn't do, what the law couldn't do, think about it, what his own power as a prophet couldn't do, what the kings of the Old Testament couldn't do, Hosea's spousal love for his own wife did. It healed her, and somehow, though he even lived and wrote centuries before the coming of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, Hosea saw that somehow God 
was promising to love his people in the same way. And when he did that, brought that kind of love in the world, that kind of love could heal our hearts. And he captured what God was going to do for Israel and through Israel then for us today. And God said this in chapter 2, full of all kind of prophetic language. Look at this. He says, therefore, I'm now going to allure her. Speaking about his people then. I will lead her into the wilderness. I'll speak tenderly to her. There I'll give her back her vineyards. And I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. What's this about? Achor is a word that means trouble. And the valley of Achor, trouble, had a story behind it. This is a specific reference to a story back in the book of Joshua about a man named Achan. You may know his story, who took plunder uh, against the law, against God's word. He lied. He kept plunder for himself when he was told not to. And because he did it, because he lied about it, the book of Joshua says that the ground opened up beneath him and swallowed him and his whole family. But God's saying, in contrast to that moment, When I do my best work, when I allure, not force, when I draw, not push, when I lead, not enslave, when I do this at its height, it's going to be like a reversal of what Achan experienced. Instead of the ground opening suddenly downward, it's going to be like a door suddenly opens upward. Instead of everlasting trouble, I'm going to bring everlasting hope. Where did that happen? Well, 800 years after Hosea's love for Gomer, the love of God became fully human. A door of hope opened forever in the world. See, Jesus Christ was totally faithful, utterly faithful to the Lord his God. And in the end, though, Jesus did for humanity what Hosea's love only hinted at. Jesus Christ himself paid the price to draw us back to God like Hosea did, except with a stunning twist Even though Jesus Christ had done nothing wrong, he went in your place, my place, our place, up on the auction block, and he got what we gomers, we people with price tags deserve for all of our unfaithfulness. Jesus of Nazareth was led out into the public square. He was mocked. He was stripped naked. He was sold for a price, but not to someone who would rescue him, put a robe around him. No, he lost his robe. He was sold to someone who would kill him at the hands of someone who betrayed him, and yet through his faithfulness and through the power of God, he was raised to life. He went into the grave as a gomer, but was raised to life as the ultimate Hosea, whose name means salvation, by the way, just like Jesus' name. See, Hosea and Jesus are both derivatives of the Jewish name Joshua, which means salvation, healing, deliverance. Jesus, our salvation, comes into the mess we've made of our own lives, and at his own cost, he pays the price to clothe us uh, with his righteousness, brings his riches into our poverty, clothes our shame with his own name, and declares to everyone listening, to the rulers, the powers, the principalities that would try to claim you, he says, no, that one is mine. He or she, they are my beloved. See, Hosea's love for Gomer, Hosea's love for Gomer points us to God's love for us. Let me close with a few questions here. If you're here today and you're from another faith system background, thank you so much for being here. Let me graciously, pointedly ask you a question. What has your God done for you to prove he loves you beyond a shadow of a doubt? Is your relationship just based on command, works, obedience alone, or is there love the center. Second, if you're wrestling today as a Christian person with something that drives you to emptiness, drives you away from God, what are you looking to more than this to tell you you're God's beloved, God's chosen? And third, finally, if you're working through something traumatic, you don't know what it's all about or what it's for, have you ever considered that maybe God is teaching you his heart for something or someone through it? Like maybe he's turning you into a kind of a prophet like Hosea, who can speak to others out of a deep love that you yourself have learned. And if you've never allowed God to love you like this, what's keeping you from it right now? We take a moment and pray for you today as we begin to close. Lord, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you for your word. It still rings true. It still echoes. It's still for us today. Through the person and lens of Jesus, we thank you for becoming a full picture of what Hosea only handed at. Thank you for coming like us, like a, like a gomer, 
going into the ground, coming up. It's our ultimate Hosea, salvation. Jesus, we give you glory and honor today. And I'm praying for everyone in here, Lord, whose heart may be gripped by some fear, by some loneliness, by some emptiness, by some hurt. Although we would allow that spousal love to come in. It's your faithfulness, affirmation, heal us. Lord, I pray every single heart today would hear those words. You're my beloved. You're my chosen one. Because of Jesus, you can say, with you, I'm well pleased. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Corey, would you come? Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's going to be a good series. <laughs> it's going to be a good series. What an incredible message of hope. I liked so many of the incredible points that Pastor Morgan pulled out of there. I thought the most transformative one that I had never thought of earlier, I told him this in between services, was when he described Jesus as going into the grave as a gomer. And I've always understood Jesus as the greater Hosea, but to understand him as the gomer naked. And I just thought, man, like how powerful, how a salvation that he do for us to walk in that place. And I thought about Hosea being going out, went out to purchase, to rescue, to save his wife. And Jesus went out, he goes out to purchase and rescue us. And that eternal salvation, that gift is not just an eternal one. It's not just a future hope, although it is a future hope, amen. But like Pastor Morgan said, it's a hope that transforms us today. And I pray, I just agree with those prayers for all of us that we enter into that place where we get to receive this incredible grace and mercy and forgiveness and love to be transformed and to see the world transformed in front of us for his kingdom can be and is on earth as is in heaven, amen. So thank you, Pastor Morgan, as always, for an incredible message. Okay, I have a couple of quick announcements. The first one is at 1 p.m. today in the Overflow Room, so if you have time to hang out, we want to invite you to our Mosaic Fort Worth Social Interest Meeting. You'll be able to hear all about the vision to reach the campuses and community of the greater Fort Worth area as we send off Pastor Alvin and Mallory and family very soon. It is bittersweet for us, but we also know that I want to kind of do a call back from Pastor Barnabas earlier. Some of y'all are going to be called to change and make the move to 1230, but we also know that some of you are going to be called and make the move to Fort Worth in the coming months because God is on the move there, and we are so excited to send him out and to see and to hear the transformed lives in that area. Amen. And if you are new here and you've never heard about Mosaic for Word and have no idea what I'm talking about, all good. We actually have a place for you today as well after service. If you are new here, welcome. We are so glad you came. Don't leave. Head out to our lobby. There's a connections area. Our team is there. They would love to meet you, get to know you, and help you get connected to all things Mosaic Austin. I gotta start saying some new things. Um, and if you would like to give today, you can do so always by going online on our website or through our church center app, or you can drop off any tithes or offerings in the giving boxes located by the double doors. And last but not least, if you would, if at home or in the room, please stand with me at this time to receive a blessing from God's word. I'd also like to invite the prayer team up at this time. If you would like to receive prayer, need prayer, Declare some faith into your space, into your circumstances, into your marriage, into your relationships, into your body, healing mind, body, soul, spirit. Man, we are here to pray. We would love to pray for you today before you leave. And now for that blessing. Everyone take a deep breath for me. It's the breath of God. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Church, thank you for coming. You are loved and you are dismissed. What a blessing it is to have you join online with Moses Church today. We are grateful for your participation with our church body. The church exists to make Jesus known and because you and I are loved by our Heavenly Father. He has invited us to play our part in making that happen. If you would like to connect to one of our ministry teams or give financially to the ministry of Mosaic and further the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ, please go to the Church Center app or head to mosaicchurchaustin.com where you can submit your gift. 
Are you ready to get plugged in to Mosaic Community? We are excited to embrace you. Whether you want to learn more about living a Christian life or becoming a member at Mosaic, you can find the orange connection card on the homepage of our website and fill that out. From the website homepage, you'll also be able to explore our community groups or request prayer. And now, as we sign offline for today, I pray you feel encouraged by the service. Keep up with Mosaic Church Austin on Instagram and Facebook throughout your week so that you have all of the latest information and inspiration. Thank you again for being with us. We love you and we are blessed by your presence.